Well, good morning, church. Would you do me a favor? Would you put your hands together and help me welcome our online audience? Excited to be with you by way of technology, whether you're on the road or at home sick this weekend, we're excited to share the gospel with you. Church, we've been in a sermon series called Break Free. Look at your neighbor and tell him you're about to be free today. All right, get the, get, the, get the juices flowing. Here we go. We're in week three. We've talked about breaking free from fear in week one, that fear is not from God, but that God gives us power, love, and soundness of mind, that God gives us the power of the Holy Spirit. He has shown us the love of the Father, and there's a peace that surpasses understanding that brings soundness of mind in Jesus Christ. And when we put our focus on Jesus, we will find ourselves free from the fears of this world and the traps that the enemy tries to throw at you and me. Because at the end of the day, what we've talked about, we went from fear to bitterness. Today we'll hit envy. Bitterness and envy both root themselves out of fear. The enemy always starts with fear and then he builds out of fear. We talked last week about bitterness, about how each and every one of us will have seasons and moments in our life where we'll have pain and we'll have to process that pain and that can be tough. But God doesn't want us to be bitter. God wants to choose. God wants us to choose to be better. And to choose to be better means to choose Jesus rather than to choose the bondage of bitterness. We talked about what it looks like to walk in forgiveness. And the power that we have to forgive comes from the cross of Jesus Christ. It's not in me. It's not in you. It's Jesus at work in us and through us. This week, we're going to continue. We're talking about breaking Free from envy. Topic everyone loves to talk about in church. I can tell by your engagement. It's fine. Next week, pastor's going to bring a word on strongholds and we'll just go uphill from here. But I'm going to bottom us out real quick on envy. We're going to talk about a struggle that's prevalent, might even say pervasive in our world today. Because people are... um, People are caught up in what's going on in the lives of others and they're losing their peace in their own life that Jesus makes available. And if I could, I would put it this way. When we struggle with fear, we have to wrestle in our minds with this thought that God won't do it or God might not do it. If we struggle with bitterness, we have to wrestle with the thought God didn't do it the way I thought he would. And when we wrestle with envy, this is the thought that we have to face. God did it for them. Why hasn't he done it yet for me? And that's real. That's raw. Because in each and every one of our lives, there's things that we see that go on in the lives of others. And it's great things that God's doing, but the enemy tries to take the great thing that God is doing in the life of someone else and turn it and twist it and turn and twist our hearts. God tells us in the word that we're to rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep not to be caught up in a spirit of envy because that spirit of envy will harm us from the inside out. I want to read a scripture and then we're going to pray. Proverbs 14, 30 says this, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. That when your heart and my heart is at peace, there's a life that is taking place in our body or there's life that is flowing through our body. The Bible says that Jesus is our peace. The Bible says that Jesus gives us peace that guards our heart and minds. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is life and life more abundantly. That's in John 10, 10. That the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy what God is trying to do. And when the Bible tells us that envy rots the bones, the picture the Bible is painting is that envy rots from the inside out. Now, people say, well, is that, is that a literal scripture or a metaphorical scripture? I would respectfully reply, who cares? Both of them are not good. <laughs> Whether envy literally rots my bones or envy metaphorically rots my bones or both. Both are possible. It could be literal. It also can be metaphorical. Jesus would say this. He would say, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. I'm praying he was being metaphorical. He was saying, remove from your life what would cause you to stumble or would cause you to sin. But the spirit behind it is real. Something needs to be removed. If you don't remove it, it will take root and it will ruin what God is trying to do. Envy, when the Bible says it rots the bones, why would I think that it's exaggerating? 
I have seen people who are eaten up with fear, bitterness, and envy, and it overcomes them from the inside out. It becomes a part of them from the inside, and then it begins to manifest itself on the outside. And people can talk all the talk that they want. At the end of the day, our actions will prove whether or not we live in freedom or we live in torment. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that whom the sun sets free is free indeed. That you offer us and make available to us by the power of the cross, freedom from fear, freedom from bitterness, freedom from envy. And that we don't have to rot in our natural body. We don't have to rot spiritually in our walk with you. No, Lord, you can make us right. You can change us from the inside out. For your word says that in Christ, the old creation becomes new. And so today, Holy Spirit, we invite you to point out anything inside of us that is not of you so that we can have a heart that is at peace and a life that is full and abundant through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Envy rots from the inside out. I wanna show you a principle in the scripture and then we're gonna go to a story. For those of you that do fill in the blank notes, I've been hitting the notes at about 20 minutes into service. So just hold on tight. We will get there eventually. I promise you, I have not forgotten. But James says this, the Bible often gives the principle in the New Testament and then gives us a picture in the Old Testament. It says, if you harbor bitter envy, the Bible makes a connection. It, three words, so powerful, harbor, bitter, and envy. If you highlight in your, in your Bible, first it uses the word harbor. Harbor meaning like where ships would come and they would harbor and they would port, giving the impression that, that, that bitterness and envy might try to come and set up shop in your life, but you have the option of whether or not you want to allow it to harbor in your ports. And some of us, to use a modern term or phrasing, we allow the enemy to live rent-free in our mind when we have the power to reject him and tell him to be gone. And the Bible says, if we harbor, it then connects them, bitter envy. If we harbor bitterness and if we harbor envy, what happens is we find ourselves with selfish ambition in our hearts. The Bible says, don't boast about this. Don't deny the truth. It says such wisdom does not come from God or it does not come down from heaven or from above, your translation might say, but it gives a progression. It is earthly, it is sensual, it's demonic. And the Bible shares that when we harbor bitter envy, the result of it or the fruit of it is you will find disorder and every evil practice. To put it most simply, here's the key thought. Envy is revealed by its fruit. Jesus would say this, you will know them by their fruit, by their fruit, they will be known. We love that scripture when we talk about the good things in our life. Oh, well, you're gonna know me by my fruit, the good fruit of Jesus at work in my life. Yes, but we also can see fruit at work in the lives of people that's not of Christ. Because the Bible says that when we abide in Christ and he abides in us, we will bring forth good fruit. But there's also times where we can distance ourselves from Christ and people will do things in their own strength, and people will do things in their own power. And the Bible says that when we're given, or we choose, or we harbor bitter envy, that the resulting fruit will be disorder and every evil practice. I wanna show it to you in a story. Uh, show of hands real quick, everybody heard of David and Goliath? Yes or no, we good on that one, okay. Um, so there's another guy in the story who's pretty important that sometimes gets overlooked. His name's Saul. He's the king. And Saul, Saul's got some struggles in his life. Saul is full of fear and he's insecure. And that insecurity would eventually lead to bitter envy. And we will see evil and every disorder and evil practice follows suit thereafter. I wanna share with you his story over the next few minutes so that we can see the picture of what the Bible shows is a principle. And then we're gonna talk about how to practically get free from envy in our own life. So there's this guy named Saul. He's the king of Israel. He was used by God. He was called by God, chosen by God. He had hands laid on him by the prophet of God. 
He was told that he would have the gift of prophecy. For those of you that like to study in the scripture, there was a season in Saul's life that Paul would actually come with the prophets and would prophesy. He was used at points in his life mightily by God. Why do I highlight this? Because sometimes we just look at Saul and we read a story and go, oh, he's a bad guy. No, he's a guy who had seasons of his life where he was on fire for God and also seasons of his life where he wasn't. And we need to be careful and we need to be aware and not think that we're above what he struggled with. Because every single one of us at any moment can be given over to envy. When I show you the trigger of what brought him into envy in just a moment, it's amazing how simple it was. The enemy is looking for a crack to slither into your life, into my life. The Bible says that they're at the Valley of Elah. The enemies of Israel have come up against them. The Philistine camp is there. Goliath is taunting them. The, the enemy has been after Israel for thousands of years. The enemy is always trying to stop what God is trying to do. We see it in the Bible times. We see it today. The enemy rages. Hell rages because he knows his time is short. Here's the problem. Jesus has already won. God has already destined what he's going to do. And God will fulfill his purpose plan. And Goliath is taunting Israel. He's taunting God's children. He says, come out and fight me. He says, one-on-one. -on -one. The Bible says he's like, I think nine foot six, has a giant spear and a shield. He was on steroids before they made steroids. Like, I mean, he's just like an ogre. And he's like, come out and fight me. One-on-one. -on -one. The Bible says that all of Israel is terrified in fear. No one will go out and fight him. Now, here's what's interesting. Saul is the king. Saul, the Bible says, is a head taller than everyone else. It gives the impression he was tall, dark, and handsome. He was rich. He had a castle. He had an army. He was called by God. He had a mantle placed on him by God. Everything that he needed to succeed, God had placed in his hands. Yet he found himself not going out to meet the enemies of God. He found himself hiding in his tent, which was his version of this. And the people of Israel are hiding. The people of Israel are cowering and Goliath is taunting. Goliath is a picture of the enemy. Who's the accuser of the brethren who accuses God's people day and night, who accuses you and accuses me. And Saul, rather than coming into the presence of God, rather than going before the Lord and asking the Lord, what should I do? Should I ride out and fight him? God, are you gonna send a deliverer? God, I'd love it if you'd send an angel maybe who could go fight for me. God, what do you wanna do? He was hiding because he was afraid. The Bible says that a, uh, a young man named David comes forth. And I, and I use that phrase young man loosely. Oftentimes we think of David and we think of this like established and mature warrior. David took the throne at 30 years old. Following the context of scripture, we don't know exactly, but there's a good chance he was 14, 15, 16 years old when he fought Goliath. You say, how do we know that? Well, the Bible tells us he was 30 when he became king. There's a whole lot of stuff that happens before he becomes king. And all of his brothers were out at war, which meant they had been drafted and he was not. And so he was not of age, to go to battle. He was the youngest of all of his brothers. He could have been younger, but there's a good chance he's 15, 16 years old. Stephen, why are you highlighting this? Because I don't care if you're a teenager. I don't care if you're a young adult. God can use you and God can use you mightily. Don't allow the enemy to discourage you or dissuade you from the call of God on your life. Whether you're 15 or 75, if there's breath in your lungs, there's a call of God on your life. And David, with faith of a mustard seed, faith of a child, goes up and he says, I'll fight this guy. He said, I'm sure. He says, I've killed a lion. I've killed a bear. The hand of God's on my life. He said, favor ain't fair. He said, I'll go fight him. And they're like, whoa, 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 David, you need to calm down. He says, no, 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 no. Y'all need to calm down. He, he uses a very, a very biblical term. He says, who does this uncircumcised Philistine think he is? What does that mean? It means who does this man who's not in covenant with God think that he is to come against the people of God? He says, I ain't worried about him. He says, God's on my side. I, I've got the Lord. I've got the Holy Spirit. I've got two thirds of the angels. We gonna be fine. I'm gonna take Goliath out. And he's sitting there before the king and Saul goes, I mean, all right, I don't wanna do it. Here's where the insecurity pictures begin. He looks at David and he says, put on my armor. 
Saul wasn't willing to go out and fight Goliath, but he sure didn't have a problem with David going and fighting Goliath looking like him. And David tried Saul's armor on. He's the king and he didn't fit in Saul's armor. And he says, I I can't fit in this. I can't wear this. I got to go out my own. I got to go out the way God's made me. And sometimes in life, I just want to encourage you, especially if you're young, God's got a call on your life. God's got a purpose on your life. And it might look different. It might be a little different. But at the end of the day, it's, it's not about armor. It's about the favor of God. You can go out with all the armor in the world, but if you don't have the hand of God on your life, you will fall. And I don't care, I don't care what God has placed in your hands. If the hand of God is on your life, you will succeed. And the favor and the hand of God was on David. He told him the hand of God's been on me. David never failed to give credit to God. David never failed to acknowledge God. The hand of God was on me when I fought the lion. The hand of God was on me when I fought the bear. The hand of God will go before me when I fight Goliath. This is the Lord's battle. He would go up to to Goliath and he would say, you come at me with a sword and a spear, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. You, you, You came to a natural fight, Goliath. This is a supernatural fight. I don't know how God did it. Goliath begins to come at him. He begins to come at David. I know that there's science with two people moving towards each other and the speed and he's slinging this rock and he's gaining momentum and he's running and he flings it forward. I don't know if God supernaturally touched that rock and it was a 95 mile an hour fastball right into Goliath's forehead. I don't know if it was science, supernatural, whatever. It was favor. I don't care. God did it. Goliath fell. Okay, that's that. Then David enters into what we'll call savage David mode. He pulls the sword out of Goliath's sheath and relieves him of his head. So just picture in your mind, 16-year-old David just defeated Goliath, picks up the sword. He's got the head. We got the beginning of a horror movie right here. And he looks at all the soldiers of Israel and is like, what y'all waiting for? These Philistines need to get got. And the Bible says that they just go into battle. They rout their enemies. Now, this is a prophetic picture. David, like we all, oh, I want to be David. David's not me. David's Jesus. David's a picture of Christ. Christ defeated the enemy, our Goliath at the cross. And we get to fight from that victory as the army of the Lord. Now, here's what's interesting. The Bible says that after they win this battle, they come back into the city. And this is where we will pick up in 1 Samuel 18. The Bible says, that after David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David and he loved him as himself. Jonathan's son, excuse me, Saul's son, Jonathan, was with David. Saul began to resist David. It begins in verse six. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the town of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with instruments. So apparently Saul liked it when he came back home that there was a parade where they would sing him songs. And as they danced, they sang the Saul. Saul has slain his thousands, which Saul loved, and David his tens of thousands. Now the Bible gives us context. It even tells us the thoughts of Saul. And Saul was very angry for this refrain displeased him greatly. The begins to quote, they have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. I read it like a Disney character, sorry. Because <laughs> in my head, that's how he's saying it. What more can he get but the kingdom? Now here's the key one, verse nine. And from that day forward, Saul kept an eye on David. Envy was triggered by five words some ladies sang in a song. This guy has a castle. This guy has a kingdom, wealth, affluence, influence, an army. The hand of God has gone before him. He's been anointed by God. He has a prophetic gift. He's got so much going for him, but he lost his peace over a line in a song over a line in a song. Why am I highlighting this? Because so many of us can have so much that God has brought into our life and we can lose our peace over a reel on a screen, over a car that our neighbor parks in their driveway, over a boat that's bigger than ours. You pick it, we faced it. I was perfectly content with the iPhone 14 till they came out with a 15 and then I knew I needed it. 
At the end of the day, there's things that are in front of us, not always bad things. Let me be clear. They're not often bad things. But there are things that are in front of us that, that God might bring into the lives of others. And if we're not able to relate to that in a healthy way, to rejoice with them that rejoice and weep them with them that weep, then what we will begin to do is we will begin to envy the blessings of God in the life of another. And what will begin to take place is we'll want to tear down someone else to build ourselves up. And that's exactly what Saul did. It doesn't need to come up on the screen, but I want to remind you of James 3. It says, where there is bitter envy and selfish ambition, their disorder and every evil practice will abound. We read in verse 9 that Saul kept a close eye on David. It tells us in the next verses, literally the next day, Saul grabs a spear in his hand and he hurls it at David saying, I will pin David to the wall. And David eluded him twice. Now, I don't know how your boss treats you, but if he throws spears at you, I'd suggest you get a new job. <laughs> but here's the root of it all. Verse 12, because bitterness and envy ties back to fear. Verse 12, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David. Verse 15, when Saul saw how successful David was, he was afraid of him. His fear was rooted in envy. And so he began to throw spears at him. He would send him on death missions, trying to get him killed. He even married, he even had his, one of his daughters marry David. And the plan was to get her to be a snare to David. He would eventually exile David. David would go live in the lands of the Philistines. He would chase David from mountain to mountain. He was determined to kill David. And rather than enjoying what God had done in his life and rejoicing in what God would do in the next generation's life, he was bitter, he was envy, he was fearful, and he lived in bondage. And eventually... Eventually, he would find himself dying alone in battle at the hands of his enemies because he had been eaten up from the inside out. I believe that Jesus wants us to be free from fear, bitterness, and envy. And today, I want to share with you three things that I believe will help us escape from envy in our life. Number one, God provides all we need. He provides all we need. You know, I don't know what season of life you're in, but I've learned this in every season of life, God will provide what you need. Sometimes we read the parable of the talents and it says one was given one, one was given two, one was given five, each according to their ability. I, I, I wish that there was a little more context in the parable sometimes because at the end of the day, I've learned this, that each according to their own ability in that season. Hear me, everyone will start at one and how faithful you are with one will get you to two. And if you're faithful with two, God can take you to three. Why do I say that? Because the man who started with five was able to take his five and bring it to 10. The five was not a lifetime assignment. It was a seasonal assignment and how well he stewarded it determined that he went from five to 10. And I know that that 10 wasn't even permanent because the parable tells us that he was so faithful that when God had the additional one, he gave it to the one who had 10, meaning you and your own strength can take five to 10, but God by his favor can take you from 10 to 11. What does that mean? How you steward today shapes your tomorrow. And it's interesting because sometimes we can be so focused on the talents and the positions and the possessions of what other people have and we can take side of what God, takes our eyes off of what God has brought into our life. And the Bible, what I word this? Um, our world focuses on what we have and God is more focused on who we become in him. I think it's a key thought. Uh, life is more than what we have, but who we become. And in our world today, our value is determined by how much money we have or how many followers we have or the positions that we have. But in the kingdom of God, our value, our value is sealed and secured and it was displayed by the love of Christ Jesus on the cross. And people in this world might value you differently, but God has already shown you how much he values you. And the word of God says, Jesus said, excuse me, that as believers, we need to watch out, Luke 12. 
and be on our guard against all types of greed or your translation might say covetousness. For life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Possessions are not wrong. Positions are not wrong. But your value is not defined by what you have. Our value is defined by who we have. And that's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And the word shares with us in Philippians 4 that God supplies all that we need. Do I wish sometimes that it says, and my God will supply all Stephen wants? Yes, I have wished that. However, it doesn't say that. It says that God supplies all that we need. Now, he, are we good to get deep for a minute? Are y'all, y'all too hungry? We good? Okay. So here's the reality. I want to give you a key thought. If we need it, God will provide it. But I want to build off of this. Sometimes God will provide you what you need today, today. But sometimes God will also provide you what you need tomorrow, today. And you're responsible to steward today so that you have what you need tomorrow. You say, what do you mean? Second Corinthians 9, 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Now it's interesting that the Bible says seed before bread because God is wanting to show us through stewardship, which would be another message for another day, that for stewardship, we don't just need to be thinking all that we can consume in a moment, but what God is placing in our hands for what he wants to do in the future. But it says that he gives us both seed and bread. Why? So that he can supply and increase and enlarge, if you will, the harvest of our righteousness. Now, in your life and in my life, sometimes God will give you more than you need today. Why? Because he's preparing you for what he wants to do tomorrow. If you spend or consume everything that he places in your hands today and you don't have what you need tomorrow, what people will often do is they'll say, well, God didn't provide all that I needed. And God will go, yes, I did. I even gave it to you in advance. Why are you complaining? And the reality is sometimes people are like, God, I want you to put more in my hands. God's like, I need you to master the one talent before I give you one and a half, respectfully. And the Bible says that when God adds to our life, if it continues on, it says enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. The intention of God as he adds to our life is that we can add to the lives of others. Envy looks to take from you to build up me. Generosity says, I want to build up you, trusting that God will build up me. And the Bible shares with us that it will result in thanksgiving to God. God wants us to steward today well, because God wants to bring better into our future tomorrow. God provides all we need. Same page? Point number two, God has blessed us. You're blessed. We're blessed. I'm blessed. And so often we can find ourselves scrolling, looking at the blessings of others or looking at the blessings of others and taking our eyes off of the blessings that God has placed right in front of us. God has blessed me, my wife, Tiffany. She's amazing. I, in the 8 a.m. service, I said she was perfect because she's on the front row, but she's close, church. She's close, <laughs> close. She's wonderful. Do I have my challenges? Yes, she has grace for me. Does she have her challenges? Yes, I have grace for her but I know that God's brought her into my life. I'm blessed. My little toddlers, Sophia and Elijah, God be praised for those kids. Do I think sometimes they're demon possessed? Yes. <laughs> um, but I know that they're a treasure. I know that they are a treasure from God into our home and that there is a call of God on their life and I am responsible to steward them for the Lord because he's placed them in my hands and I'm blessed. Do I see how well sometimes your kids behave in public versus mine and have to struggle with thoughts of envy? Yes, but I don't have to harbor it. I can reject it. The enemy is looking to creep in with envy in so many areas of our life, our relationships, our finances, uh, our marriage with our kids, in the church, in the church. They got to be the greeter at the front door and I was the greeter at the side door. I can't believe God did that. 
I'm like, lucky you, that's less times you got to open the door. You get the same credit with God. God has blessed us. We're blessed to be in this nation where we can freely worship the Lord. We're blessed to be, I'm blessed to be in this church where there are men and women who love Jesus and serve God and are influencing Northwest Florida for the glory of God. I am blessed to be a part of a small group of amazing men who come together and love Jesus and serve Jesus. I, I mean, do I got complaints in life? Yeah, everybody's got complaints. Ignore your complaints and focus on the cross of Christ and what he's brought into your life. And the worldly thinking, the worldly thinking is I can achieve it. I can earn it. Here's the problem. It's a key thought. Contentment isn't earned. It's learned. Amen. It's learned. Say, so where do you find that? Straight out of the Bible. Philippians 4, 11, Paul would say this. I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I've... Uh, I've abased, which means to have little or nothing. And I've abound, which means to have a lot. He says, whether I have a lot or I have a little, everywhere and in all things on the scale, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And this is what he says. I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Now, many people, they see that scripture on a Facebook timeline taken grossly out of context. Let's bring it back into context today. Does I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me mean that you can climb up on the roof, decide that you can fly and jump? No. You will last a solid second and a half before you hit the ground, depending on your weight and gravity. It's not a license to do whatever you want whenever you want. It's a revelation that no matter what you face, Jesus Christ can help you get to the other side. That when you feel weak, he is strong. That when you feel like you are not able, he is more than able. For Christ is in all things and through Christ, all things are made. And through Christ, all things are for him. At the end of the day, uh, Colossians says that, 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 that he has the supremacy. It always points back to Christ. It's not me. It's not you. It's not us. It's Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. And he has provided all that we need. He has blessed us. And point number three, he calls us to bless others. Jesus would say in the scripture that we're to pray for those who persecute us, to bless those who curse us. I know that the world says if somebody comes against you, you're to come back at them, but that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, essentially, we don't have to be bitter. We can, we can be better. Jesus shares with us that we don't have to respond like the world. We can respond differently. Envy says, I want to take from you to build up me. Jesus said, no, I want to come and I want to give to you. I want to lay down my life as a ransom for many. And I would just share this, this thought with you that the proof or the fruit of contentment in your life is seen in generosity. And I want to show it to you in the scripture. David had been pursued half of his life, exiled from his land. He was the hero who was not celebrated. Saul had taken so much from him. He had taken family members from him. He had taken possessions from him. But David refused to be bitter because he knew that God had something better for him. David refused to operate out of bitter envy. There came a time, I just want to share some quick things with you. There came a time where Saul was pursuing him and Saul had to go to the restroom and they didn't have porta potties on the side of the mountains. So the king went into a cave with some privacy. It happened to be the very cave that David was in. And David had the opportunity to kill King Saul and to take the throne. David refused to tear down another man to build himself up. David said, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. I'm not going to come into my calling by doing something unclean. And in his life, David refused to respond out of bitter envy. David was not a perfect man. Please hear me. David was not a perfect man, but he was a man who was after God's 
heart. What does that mean? When he made mistakes, he didn't run to prison. He ran to the cross. When he, when he, when he had a choice to make, he came to the cross. When people abandoned him, a uh, Ziklag, I can't remember where it is in the scripture. I want to say it's First Samuel 27 or 28. He's at Ziklag and, and, the, and the city's been burned down and his men are weeping and his men are about to turn on him. And he's all by himself. People will fail you, but God won't. The Bible says that he strengthened himself in the Lord. He strengthened himself in the Lord. He finally, finally, finally is able to step into years later what God had promised him. And sometimes that's life. We wait for years holding on to a promise that God has given us. As we sang today, hold on to hope. If God's promised it, God will provide it. It might not be when you want, but it's when he says it's right. And he steps in to his leadership position, if you will. And one of the first things that he asks is in 2 Samuel 9, he says, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? You see, in culture and in the world in that times when a king took over, he would wipe out the family line of the last king. I would just take him out. That's not David. That wasn't his heart. Even though Saul had wronged him, even though he had been wronged, he wanted to do what was right before the Lord. And they said to him, there's this young man by the name of Mephibosheth. He's Saul's grandson, Jonathan's son. And David says, bring him to me. Mephibosheth is probably thinking he's about to get executed. And the Bible says he's brought before the king. And David says this, verse seven, don't be afraid, David said to him. Don't, don't be full of fear. For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king told him all of his lands would be restored. This is in verse 11. And Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. David restored to him what had been lost. David gave him a position at his table to eat and David treated him like one of his sons. I believe that this is a prophetic picture of what God has done to us, not for Jonathan's sake, but for Christ's sake. You see, through the cross, Christ restored to us that which had been stolen by the enemy. At the cross, Christ restored to us a seat at the table of God in heaven. At the cross, Christ restored to us right relationship. Galatians says this, and he has given us the right to be called sons of God. You and I have the opportunity to be a part of the family of God for Christ's sake. Because Christ did for you and for me what we couldn't do for ourselves. We don't have to be tormented by fear, bitterness, or envy. No, we can be free to love, free, filled with joy, and free at peace because of Christ and in Christ by the power of Christ in Jesus' name. So with every head bow and every eye close, let's talk. If you don't know Jesus, you live in torment but you can be set free today. It's not your work, it's not your achievement, it's not earned, it's received. You and I, we have no room to boast, it's all Jesus Christ. I just get to receive what he's done for me. And if you have not received Jesus Christ as your savior, and if you have not placed or made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, you have this opportunity today. And I don't know if you've ever been to church before, but I want you to know this is a safe place. A room full of men and women who have been in the same place you're in right now, myself included. And the power of Christ is greater than your past. The power of Christ is greater than what you're facing today. And I don't care what lies have been whispered in your ear by people. Christ receives you and Christ desires to call you son or daughter. And so we're all gonna pray together in a moment. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand or anything, but if you wanna come connect with our prayer team at the end, 
Maybe go to a next steps table at the end or fill out a prayer request and we'll reach out to you. At your pace, we wanna help you. But this is more than a prayer and a check the box. This is the beginning of a relationship because that's what Jesus wants with you. And if you mean it and you believe it, he'll seal it and things will begin to change. As you change your mind, he'll change your heart. Here we go. Lord Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner. You're the savior. You died for my sin and you rose from the grave. I believe in you and I give my life to you. You're my savior. You're my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give God some praise. Amen. I want to invite you to stand. I'm going to call our prayer team forward. If you need prayer for anything, we got some amazing men and women who would love to pray with you, for you, over you. Let me bless you real quick. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this church. Thank you for these men and women who walk in freedom. I thank you for what you're doing in Northwest Florida and all around this world. May your kingdom continue to advance and the gospel be proclaimed throughout the earth. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Have a great week. Next week, Pastor, we'll continue our series. Be blessed.